Thank you very much all for coming uh, to this uh, occasion. We have a room which is perhaps a bit large and I hope we need it, but because this, uh, this is an artifact of the fact that this is not our usual time. Uh, <coughs> today's speaker is Robert L. Stuff. Robert did a PhD uh, at the University of Paris 1, uh, Sorbonne, Pontéon, Pontéon, Sorbonne, I'm sorry, under the constant provision of Anouk Barbarous and Max Kistler, and he has won several prizes, young researcher <coughs> prizes, among them of the French Society for Philosophy of Science, and has publications in La Tussenso, which is their journal, as well as uh, Synthese. Today he will be talking about thought experiments, and in particular about Galileo's thought experiments. And his title is The Function and Limit of Galileo's Falling Bodies Thought Experiment, Absolute Weight, Specific Weight, and the Medium Resistance. Very pleased to have you here. Uh, Thanks, so Chris. Please Thank you for having me in this project. Very nice being in Geneva. So, uh, let me start by the plan of the talk. I'll start with the current state, a uh, few words on the debate on thought experiments, and then I'll move directly, it's, we know it's a historical analysis of Galileo thought experiments, so I'll move directly to the two occurrences of the thought experiment in 1590 and then 50 years later in 1638. I will show that it had, uh, following the same thought experiment, Galileo defended two different and incompatible theories of three pole in the De Moto and in the Discorsi, and then I conclude by drawing some implications to the epistemological debate on those experiments. So, just as a background, so the, the literature on thought experiments starts mainly with Kuhn's, what he called paradox, or I like to call puzzling question on thought experiments. So how, relying exclusively upon familiar data, can a thought experiment lead to new knowledge or new understanding of nature? And here the emphasis is what kind of data do you have in the scenario of a thought experiment, and how, what kind of knowledge does it lead to, and how? So in the literature of thought experiments, my impression is that it's built on a historical analysis of case studies. Several examples we have that we can, I don't know, we have this intuition that's really ahistorical. So why Galileo thought experiments? For several reasons, most of them is, uh, it takes a central stage in the Northern Brown epistemic debate on thought experiments. Most epistemic accounts tackle the thought experiment in order to analyze it. And even Galilean scholars tackle the same thought experiments, for example, called Coiré, Palmieri, and Van Dyck. And I want to do a historical analysis because we still can find that Stanford Encyclopedia entry in 2014. So, uh, it's, two, it's 1996, I think, but substantially revised in 2014 that Galileo showed that all bodies fall at the same speed with a brilliant thought experiment. So I'm going to show that's not the case. So in Northern Brown debate, the thought experiment plays a central law because, role because Brown takes it as a canonical example, and that's since 1986, of a platonic thought experiment. That is a thought experiment that is Constructive, it destroys an existing theory, a total theory of three-fold. And it's also constructive for Brown, since it established a new theory, that is Galileo theory of three-fold, in void all bodies fall at the same speed. And that without any new empirical data, and without it being a logical deduction from all data. So Norton reply in 1996, no, that actually the thought experiment could be reconstructed as a deductive argument, and it could lead to both conclusions as well in a deductive manner. It could lead to the destructive conclusion straightforward as a reductio argument, but to lead to the constructive conclusion, you should add assumption 8a that the speed of falling body depends only on its weight. And for Northern, that, for Northern, that amounts to assuming vacuum, which is something Galileo did, was not able to do at the time. So, <clears throat> this philosophical literature on, on thought experiments ignores several things. So the scenario of Galileo thought experiment takes place in plenum and not in void, as North 
important highlights that void is still impossible at this time of the, of, of, of the debate between Salviato and the Simplici. And this fact is not that much ignored, but the rest is. So the thought experiment is restricted, is limited in its scenario and its conclusion to bodies made of the same material that is, have the same specific gravity. And that restriction will turn out to be crucial to understand the thought experiment. And we should analyze the thought experiment role in the global argument of strategies in both of them, in 1590 and 1638. If we do that, we can try to then to answer if and how the thought experiment justifies its exclusion, because we analyzed what the thought experiment function is or its conclusion. So the debate mainly between several philosophers they do, do not even agree what the intended conclusion of the thought experiment is. So this is why it's important to do a historical analysis. I will argue that uh, the thought experiment eliminates causal factors. The thought experiment, the whole uh, humanist strategy actually eliminates causal factors. The thought experiment eliminates absolute weights as a causal factor, while the rest of the argument el tackles specific weights in 1590, they are, they remain co a causal factor. In 1638, Galileo presents two, several, two additional arguments to eliminate specific weight as a causal factor. Okay, so let's get to the historical analysis. So I'll, uh, the thought experiment, I'll analyze the 1590 version. It's nearly the same, but it's more elaborated on, before the thought experiment, the, the, the reasoning process is more elaborate and, and the demoto, which is a manus manuscript from 1590, non-published. So Galileo starts by clarifying the concept of what do we mean by heaviness and lightness. And we should understand in terms of specific weight. So even if Galileo is comparing equal volumes, not unit volumes of bodies, and he doesn't define the term specific weight, we can see that he's using that. So a thing should be called heavier than another. If when a piece of it is taken equal to a piece of the other, it is found to be heavier than the, other, than the piece of the other. And he used all the time the same formulation. So for, for simplicity, I bracketed everything and I put specific weight all the time. So the, this part of the Demoto's general aim is the following. Inequalities in the slowness and swiftness of motion occurs in two ways. For either the same mobile is moved in different media, and that is according to Aristotle principle two of his theory of free fall, natural speed is inversely proportional to the medium's resistance, or the medium is the same, but the mobiles are, are different. And that is described by Aristotle principle I, natural speed is proportional to weight. And here's what Galileo aims to do. We will demonstrate surely that in both cases of motion, the slowness and swiftness depends on the same cause namely the greater or lesser heaviness of the media and the mobile. So heaviness here is to be understood as specific weight. But first we will show that the cause of such an effect, which has been conveyed by Aristotle in principle I and 2i, is insufficient. So for the thought experiment, Galileo will focus on this. The medium is the same, but the mobiles are different, which is described by Aristotle principle I. So here, here's what Galileo says. Difference between two mobiles can happen in two ways. For either they are of the same species, as for example, both lead or both iron, and they differ in size. Or they are of different species, one iron, the other of wood, and they, they differ from one another, either in size and in heaviness, or in heaviness and not size, or in size and not in heaviness. So put differently in a graph, you have inequalities of speed, the two cases that he uh, labeled at the beginning, different mobiles, same medium, same mobile, different medium. And then for these cases, you have either same species or different species. If they are of different species, they could differ in three several ways. If they are of the same species, they differ only in size. Of course, shape and everything are not taken into consideration here. So the thought experiment is limited to that part of the hierarchy. So inequalities of speed, different mobile, same species, different size. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, okay, great. So the aim of thought experiment is to refute principle I. Concerning those mobiles that are of the same species, Aristotle has said that the larger is moved, the larger is moved faster. He wants mobile of the same genus 
to observe between themselves and the speed of motion the ratio of the sizes that this mobile has. And he said that very openly by affirming that a large piece of gold is carried more swiftly than a smaller one. So Galileo starts by refuting that on an empirical basis, or semi-empirical basis. So how ridiculous this opinion is, is clearer than daylight. For who will ever believe that if, for example, from a high tower, two stones, one being the double size of the other, were thrown at the same moment, when the smaller was at mid-tower, the larger would already have reached the ground. But that does not suffice for Galileo, and he continues. But in order that we may always make more use of reasons than of examples, empirical examples, you want to say, for we are seeking the causes of facts, and in here lies the, the function of the thought experiment and the whole argumentative strategy, which they are not reported by experience. We will bring forth our way of thinking, whose confirmation will re result in the downfall of Aristotle opinion. We say then that mobiles of the same species, though they may differ in size, are however moved with the same swiftness. And the largest stone does not go down more swiftly than a smaller one. So here, uh, Galileo will introduce his first Archimedean analogy in order to refute this uh, principle. Uh, I. Those who are surprised by this conclusion will also be surprised that a large beam can float on water just as well as a small piece of wood for the reasoning is the same. And just before the thought experiment, he'll go to explore that analogy in a three-step argument. So in the first, Galileo imagines that the specific weight of the water decreases. And then he asks, who would ever say that the beam would go down first or more swiftly than the small piece of wood? In the second step, he will uh, uh, inverse the his reasoning, and he will imagine that the specific weight of the mobile increases and ask who would ever believe if we took a particle of such a wax, so he filled the, the wood with wax, say one hundredth of it, either that it would not go down or that it would go down a hundred times more slowly than the totality of the wax. And the third argument is the following. Galileo will explore this analogy between the balance and bodies floating on water. And it will be possible to experience the same things in the balance. For if very large equal weights are placed on each other and on each side, and then to one of them something heavy but only modestly so is added, the heavier then will go down, but not any more swiftly than if the weights had been small. So in a balance, what is it, what's important is not the specific weight nor the absolute weight of the two bodies, it's the difference in absolute weight between the body and the added body. In water, the reasoning holds, and the reasoning holds in water, but in terms of specific weight. For the beam corresponds to one of the weights of the balance, while the other weight is represented by an amount of water as great in size as the size of the beam, so specific weight. If this amount of water weighs the same as the beam, then the beam will not go down. If the beam is made slightly heavier in such a way that it goes down, it will not go down more swiftly than a small piece of the same wood. So having presented this three-step argument, Galileo will now arrive to his thought experiment, finally. But it's pleasing to confirm this, so the reputation of principle I, by another argument. And first, let the following be presupposed. If there are two mobiles, one of which is moved faster than the other, the combination of the two is moved more slowly than the faster, but more swiftly than the slower. And this is what we call it, the literature following gender, the mediativity principle. If you have two mobiles and you attach them, if one of them is faster than the other, then the combination will be somewhere in between. And this is the scenario of the thought experiment. So let there be two mobiles of the same species, the larger A and the smaller B. And if it can be done as our adversary holds, let A be moved more swiftly than B. There are then two mobiles, one of which is moved more swiftly than the other. Hence, according to what has been presupposed, so here, the combination of the two will be moved more slowly than A. But A and B is larger than A by itself. And hence, contrary to our adversary's views, the larger mobile will be moved more slowly than the smaller, which would certainly be unsuitable. So according to Palmieri, who, did the, who read the Latin text, he describes it as an absurdity, unsuitable, which is correct, I think. 
And this is what finally Galileo concludes from his thought experiments. Accordingly, let it be sufficiently confirmed that there exists no cause per se why mobile of the same species should be moved with unequal speed. But there certainly is one why they should, should be moved with equal speeds. But if there were some accidental cause, such as, for example, the shape, it must, but, must be, not be classified among the causes per se. So this is very clear in, in Galileo's own words that he's seeking causes of, uh, of, uh, of inequalities of speed. And in the case that they have the same species and differ only in size, so he's, he, he, he managed to isolate absolute weight as a causal factor. He arrived at the an, an absurdity and his conclusion that absolute weight could not be a causal factor. And now what he aims to do is, oh, sorry, go to the rest of the situations. So Galileo now moved to the remaining situation, especially mobiles deferring only in heaviness and not in size. So, heaviness and not in size, because for him, the other two are reduced to this one. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but it depends on the conclusion of the thought experiment. And this is what he says. And so in order that we may find this ratio, so the, for mobiles deferring in heaviness and not in size, and again against Aristotle's way of thinking, show that in no way do mobiles observe the ratio of their heaviness, even if they are of different Species. So this is principle I again. We will demonstrate things on which depend the answer not only to this investigation, but also to the investigation of the ratio of the motion of the same mobile in different media. So the other part of the graph. So this is principle two. And we will examine both questions simultaneously. He will build on the following uh, second Archimedean analogy to defend his early theory of free fall. And there it is. So all these things, so inequalities of motion in different situations, will easily be drawn from the following demonstration. I say then that the solid magnitude heavier than water is carried downward with as much force as that by which a quantity of water having a size equal to the size of the same magnitude, so having the same specific weight, is lighter than this magnitude. So it, the difference of specific weight between the mobile and the medium. And this is what is going to defend, actually, in the motto, that speed is proportional to the specific weight difference of the mobile and the medium. And he explained that, that for the first case, the same mo so uh, principle I, same mobile falling in two different media, the ratio of one another of the excess of its own heaviness over the heaviness, heavi uh, heavinesses of the media. So concerning principle I, similarly, the answer to the other question is evident what ratio speed of mobiles equal in size but unequal in specific weight observe with one another in the same medium for the speed of such mobile would be one another at the excess by which the specific weight of the mobile exceed, exceeds the specific weight of the medium which follows that the speed is not aristotle geometric ratio w over r which is weight over resistance but something like this, an Archimedean ratio, Wb minus Wm, Wv and Wm being the specific weights of the body and the, and, and the medium. Thus in void, where the medium uh, is, uh, the resistance of the medium is zero, a mobile force proportionally to its own specific weight. And this is also clear in Galicerillo's text. In a void, a mobile will be moved in the same way as in plenum. And thus, in a void, it will be moved according to the excess of its heaviness over the heaviness of the void. Since this is null, the excess of the heaviness of the mobile over the heaviness of the void will be the total heaviness of the same mobile. Thus, it will be moved swiftly according to its own total heaviness. So in the demoto, the theory that is holding that in void, bodies fall according to their specific weight. So specific weight remains a causal factor. Yeah, but just uh, a point. So here Galileo hesitates directly after and says, a very great difficulty arises here. It will be found that these ratios are not observed by one who has made the test. <laughs> However, without exploring this further, since he convinced that it's necessary, it's necessary first to examine certain things which have not yet been inspected. For, for instance, acceleration. It's in 1590 and Galileo didn't publish that and it was decades before 
the theory of accelerated motion. Okay, so let's move to the 50 years uh, later, and now we have the old Galileo using the same thought experiment with the same conclusion. So I'm not going into that again. But it's part of a larger argumentative strategy that spans at least for 30 pages. So we will offer two arguments and one real experiment in order to eliminate specific weight as a causal factor. So the first is a limiting case argument, and the second is a constant cause, constant effect argument. And at the end, he is going, he's going also by analogy to do a real experiment on pendulum. I'm not going into that today. So I'm just going to focus on these two points. So here's the limiting case argument. So just after the thought experiment, Galileo also wants to see how mobiles fall in different, uh, they, they have different specific weights in different media. So in a medium of quicksilver, gold not merely sinks to the bottom more rapidly than lead, but it's the only substance that will descend at all. All other metals and stone rise to the surface and float. On the other hand, The variation of speed and air between balls of gold, lead, copper, porphyry, and the other met heavy material is so light that in a fall of 100 qubit, a ball of gold not surely, uh, would surely not outstrip one of copper by as much as four fingers. Having observed this, I came to the conclusion that in a medium totally devoid of resistance, all bodies fall with the same speed. So this is the first argument that convinces Galileo that all bodies should fall at the same speed irrespective of their specific weight. However, it's just specific weight is probably not the causal factor following this argument, and we'll see why. So if you find that the fact that the variation of speed among bodies of different specific gravities is less and less according to the medium becomes more and more yielding, and if finally in a medium of extreme tenuity Though not a perfect vacuum, we found that in spite of great diversity of specific weight, the difference in speed is very small and almost inappreciable. Then we are justified in believing that it's highly probable that in a vacuum, bodies would fall with the same speed. And that's the case, we could see that with Palmieri diagram. So what he calls the restricted th theory is the motor early theory and the general theory is the discourses theory. And you can see if the medium specific gravity goes to limit zero, the theory tells you, yeah, okay, th the difference will be uh, less, but at the limit, you still have a small difference in, uh, in their speed of fall, depending on their specific weight. So here, specific weight remain a causal factor. And here, specific weight is no longer a causal factor. It goes to zero. But this limiting case argument is compatible with both. Nobody tells us at the limiting case if we still have a small difference or not. So Galileo needed one additional argument in order to finally confirm the theory and to, to eliminate the specific weight as a causal factor. And this is fall from small and high altitude. So he started setting the stage for this argument by uh, Salviati. So he says, now Simplicio, if you allow, so Simplicio is the spokesman of the Aristotelians, and Salviati is spokesman of, of uh, Galileo in the discourse. If you allow these two mobiles, an inflated bladder and a mass of lead, so of different material, to fall from a height of four or six qubits, by what distance do you imagine the lead will anticipate the bladder? You may be sure that the lead will not travel three times or even twice as swiftly as the bladder. Also, you could have made it move a thousand times as rapidly. So if you let them go from a small distance, the difference is very small. To which some please you agree, but adds that if they fall from high altitude, the difference will be bigger. So it may, may be, as you say, during the first four or six qubit of the fall, but after the motion has continued for a while, I believe that the lead will have left the bladder behind not only six out of 12 parts, of the distance, but even eight or 10. And here Galileo is very happy because, <laughs> because this is what he was aiming at. Okay, of course, he wrote that, so. <laughs> so, uh, it was bring Salviati to even, to accept simplicity challenge and even raise. So I quite agree with you and doubt not that in a very long distance the lead might cover 100 miles while the bladder was tra traversing one. 
But my dear Sulpicio, this phenomena which you adduce against my proposition is precisely the one which confirms it. So with this argument, he will pass from highly probable to confirm finally. That specific weight could not be a causal factor. And th this is the argument that which I call, Coire also calls constant cause, cost, constant effect argument. So he summarizes again. So let me once explain that the variation of speed observed in bodies of different specific gravities is not caused by the difference of specific gravity. So here he's refuting his old early de Moto theory. But depend upon external circumstances, in particular the resist of, uh, resistance of the medium. So that if it's removed, all body would fall with the same velocity. And this result I deduce mainly from the fact which you have just admitted, and which is very true, namely that in the case of body which differ widely in specific weight, their velocities differed more and more at the space traverse increase. Something which would not occur if the effect depend upon difference of specific gravity. Because constant cause, constant effect. For since the specific gravities remain constant, the ratio between the distance traversed ought to remain constant as well. Whereas the fact that this, is that, that this ratio co keeps on increasing as the motion continues. Simply you remain unpersuaded by this, that this difference in speed should be caused by the medium resistance. And he replies by using the same argument. Very well, but following your own line of argument, if difference of weight in bodies of a different specific gravities cannot produce a change in the ratio of their speeds, on the ground that the specific gravities does not change, how is it possible for the medium, which also is supposed to remain constant, to bring about any change in the ratio of these velocities? And this will provide, finally, Galileo to explain the role of the medium resistance and specific weight in, in, in a theory of free fall. So if we can compare them with the demoto uh, in few words, so in the demoto, the medium makes the body lighter. So it's just have an Archimedean thrust. In the discourse, it makes the body lighter, but in addition, it has a frictional effect. So there is an increase in the resistance of the medium, not on an account of any change in its essential properties, but on the account of the change in rapidity with which it must yield and give way laterally to the passage of the falling body which is being constantly accelerated. So you should imagine what she's imagining a little bit. So the body is falling, the medium is resisting, and the body has to just push away the particles or the, of, of the medium in order to, 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 uh, to fall, to have a So specific weight also is uh, treated differently in De Moto and uh, Discorsi. So in the demoto and following the Hayek Archimedean analogy, Galileo concludes that, concludes that speed is proportional to specific weight even in void. In this course, specific weight is the means employed by the falling body to open a path for itself and to push aside parts of the medium. Something which does not happen in vacuum where therefore no differences of speed is to be expected from a difference of specific gravity. So finally, he eliminates specific gravity as a causal factor. OK, so following this historical analysis, I'll have to say a few words about the debate as a conclusion. In particular, let me so highlight what, what we can learn from this analysis concerning two things. So contrary to Brown, to Brown it's Straightforward that the strong reading of the law cannot be upheld. I will say two words about the weak, weaker reading, which also cannot be upheld. And contrary to Norton, actually there's a function for the particular involved in both experiments. So the str strong reading of the law, as Brown says, so avoid all bodies fall at the same speed. And this is in multiple articles, his books, and in Stanford Encyclopedia, we can, we can cite it. However, both 1590 and 1638 theories are consistent with and follow from the same thought experiment. So following the same thought experiment, we still don't know if speed is proportional to specific weight or not. So the thought experiment does not lead to any law of nature. So on its own does not reveal and a fortiori justify any law of nature, be it platonically or otherwise. So contrary to Norton, I have to say a few words about his argument approach or few. 
So Norton maintained that, part, uh, that thought experiments are deductive or inductive argument, which involve particulars which are irrelevant to the generality of the conclusion. In addition, he defends the elimination thesis that is any conclusion reached by a good thought experiment will also be demonstrable by an argument which does not contain these particulars and therefore is not a thought experiment. So the particular doesn't have any role to play in the thought experiment. However, in Galileo's case, we can see one important function for these particulars. They allow Galileo to isolate the effect of absolute weight without assuming vacuum. And this is clear in Galileo's text. Just after the thought experiment, he tells Simplicio that Aristotle de declares that bodies of different weights in the same medium travel in so far as their motion depends upon gravity with speeds which are proportional to their weight. And this he illustrates by use of bodies which is possible to perceive the pure and unaltered, <laughs> I don't know how to spell this, effect of gravity, eliminating other considerations. So the, the, the particulars used in Galileo's experiment are, serves Galileo to eliminate all other considerations. So the, Galileo would use this particular in order to do Norton assumption 8a, eight, eight, so just like no, know the little bit about it, without assuming vacuum. So again, for uh, in Brown, let's see if a weaker reading of the law could, could emerge from the thought experiment, that is the quality of speed of all bodies of the same material. No, from the thought experiment, we only have the equality for special cases which are same material, same shape, fo falling in a rare medium such as air, the where the effect of the medium resistance could be accounted for or ignored because there's still one effect of the medium resistance that is not accounted for in the thought experiment. Still have two minutes? Yeah. And yeah, okay, which is not the case, for example, as a nugget, for a nugget on the leaf of gold, which is an example given by Galileo, this quality of, of speed doesn't apply following the thought experiment because you're not assuming vacuum to these cases. These are bodies made of the same material, a nugget on the leaf of gold. So uh, just few words about a small effect that remains unaccounted for in the thought experiment and Galileo just ignores. So, which affect disproportionately even the particulars used in the thought experiment. So, a big, uh, two mobiles, same uh, species, differing only in size. And Galileo makes reference to the small effect just directly before the previous quotation that Aristotle declares, blah, blah, blah. So he said, you find on making the experiment that the larger outstrips the smaller by two fingers. And then dismisses this difference on the account that Simplicio would not hide behind these two uh, fingers the 99 qubit of Aristotle. And what I submit is that Galileo is in a position to ignore the small effect of the medium resistance because 20 pages later, Galileo comes back to this effect and sets out to explain how one and the same medium produces such a different retardation in bodies which are made of the same material and have the same shape but differ only in size. So he provides the explanation of this small effect which he ignored in the thought experiment. Thank you. You won't field your own questions, so we do more open to that. Whatever. So what yeah. No, I can I can do it. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Please. Obviously, you've read all of this much more recently, and uh, you know, I may not uh, have it all in my mind, but it's, it, the interesting and somewhat surprising claim you make is that the weaker reading of the thought experiment, the, the conclusion we're supposed to be drawing, is also should, could not be maintained, really. Um, and I found a passage from the, the discourse it's on page 66 and yeah. following from in the English translation from 1914. He does say that. Where he says, it's possible to prove clearly by means of a short and conclusive argument. And then he comes, the example with the two bodies connected, and he infers, because this is quite a general problem for any theory supposing otherwise, 
We infer, therefore, that large and small bodies move at the same speed, provided they are of the same specific gravity. No mention of any sort of limitations on it. So that seems, at least, if we mistook him to be, have established a weaker reading, the weaker conclusion, then it's because that's what he tells yeah. us done. Yeah, but directly after, he says that you find on making the experiment that the larger outstrips the smaller by two fingers. So if you take into account the medium resistance, which is the case for the thought experiment, the scenario happens in planar, not in void, because the whole discussion is about, is about uh, the possibility of the existence of void. So Galileo is no, in no position to assume vacuum. And uh, indeed, he says that, but he, he's referring to, to, to bodies made of the same material having the same shape, of course, because just directly after he says, that uh, are not good, and uh, is this, is all of these are the same paragraph that, uh, okay. yeah, go. So if you assume that it's in plenum, which Galileo does, it's not in void, you will have this equality for a few special cases, which are big, heavy bodies falling in a rare medium, such as the air. And this is what you get. You cannot say, following the thought experiment, that a nugget of gold and a leaf of gold fall at the same speed. No, 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 but that's... Um that's what I was saying to the weaker re reading of uh, all bodies of the same material. So the stronger reading is all bodies. And void, all bodies fall at the same speed. And this is what Norton, uh, Brown says all the time. The weaker reading is of the same material. I mean, we can have us all a weaker, weaker reading also that it's not no longer a law of nature. I mean, it's just applicable for a few special kind of bodies, a few special cases. Let me, if, if, unless some of you want to jump in, let me come back one more time. So the way I've understood this, uh, perhaps falsely, but the way I understood this is, look, there are a number of potential, different potential causal factors which determine the speed of falling bodies. Um, and he considers which ones should play what role and which ones could be eliminated, etc. And I took him with this simple thought experiment with the connecting two bodies, a light one and a heavier one, to be showing that you get some sort of deeper problem than a slight difference in, 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 in falling speeds if you assume that the specific gravity is, is a causal factor. The absolute. Wait, not specifically. Because mo bodies are made of the same sorry, species. Sorry, sorry, yes, yes. That's yeah, sorry. yeah, but that's exactly uh, what I'm defending. So the thought experiment serves to eliminate absolute, absolute weight as a causal factor. Mm -hmm. But does it bring about any law of nature? I, I mean, a law of nature very restricted to this is a fall of bodies that the, where the medium doesn't have any effect of a very small one, let's say. So following the thought experiment, if we want to say something like this, equality of s for all bodies of the same material, on a weaker reading of the load, we will have to assume vacuum in such a way that the nugget of and the leaf of gold fall at the same speed. But if you, if still, if you say, no, okay, let's just, look, let's look at the bodies of the same material, all lead or whatever, something, all the same. Some are heavier than others, absolute weight yeah. may differ. Um, but if we accept that and then have a theory according to which that absolute weight plays a causal role of, in the speed of their, of their falling, such as in Aristotle, you get inconsistencies of the kind illustrated exactly. by that thought experiment, regardless of whether they end up falling at the same, yeah. at the same speed or not. So, it may be, I'm not sure what I'm saying here. No, but that is exactly <laughs> what I'm defending, that the thought experiment okay. eliminates so absolute weight as <coughs> a causal factor. If not, you will have an inconsistency yes. between the mediativity principle okay. and uh, a theory that says absolute weight, like Aristotle, that puts absolute weight as a, as a, as a causal factor. Okay. So this is uh, reflected a little bit in Gandler's analysis, uh, absolute weight, uh, is uh, additive, speed is mediative, so. And that's how I teach it, but maybe it's yeah. a yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, but I mean, of course, but, uh, it's, it's a good example, but also she ignores that uh, it's limited to the... But for her analysis, it's okay. It denotes that the floating pendant is limited to bodies of the same material. She doesn't really, she says it in a footnote, but she doesn't analyze. What I'm saying here is that this analysis is, is, is interesting because, first of all, it puts the thought experiment back in the argumentative strategy, and you can see how Galileo eliminated different floating factors, one after the other, especially after Newton's specific theory. And now we couldn't do that in 1590, following the same principle. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what is the, the impact uh, of the uh, historical analysis of what, what Galileo did on the philosophical theories of, of thought experiment of yeah. Brown and, and, and Norton? Uh, so on Brown, it's a, I think it refutes the Brown account because Brown takes uh, Galileo thought experiment as a platonic example, as a canonical example of a platonic thought experiment that it destroys a theory and it establishes another. As you can see, it doesn't establish any theory. Yeah. So Maybe the one that Galileo actually did doesn't, but the one which, which is ascribed to him, and maybe Galileo never did because he was always assuming that uh, since Galileo was uh, always considering things that fall in a medium and not never done yeah. really the, the thought experiment okay, with Barco. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he never he didn't, he didn't actually the one which is ascribed to him. But if he had done the other one, maybe that would have been in, in Void you also. Right, yeah. Yeah, but at most what you can recover in Void is that all bodies of the same material fall at the same speed. Because following the thought experiment, you have no idea if specific rate should play a role or not. So you don't think that it's even possible to design a thought experiment which would uh, give you that form to what Brown said. Yeah, that all bodies fall at the same speed. I, I have never thought about it, but I don't think so. Because if you if you take two bodies of different material and join them together, they are mediative because specific rate is mediative. Mm -hmm. So there is no inconsistency following a thought experiment that takes wood and lead and join them together. Well, the combination is somewhere in between because specific rate is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So following Gendler's analysis, you have specific rate is mediative, speed is mediative, Therefore, the speed of fall is proportional to specific rate. No inconsistency. So you don't think that there is just a, an historical inaccuracy, it is also a philosophical. Yeah, yeah. The argument, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot eliminate specific rate as a causal factor from that of the thought experiment. Okay. It's not the function at all. But probably the implications for Norton's way of thinking about thought experiments are a bit less devastating than for Brown's. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's just that the particular... You can reconstruct this yeah. as an argument. Yeah. Maybe the reconstruction that oh. Norton gives is, is historically inaccurate, needs to be corrected to, to be historically, uh, you know, really what yeah. Galileo does, but presumably no. that can be done. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My problem with Norton is not that it cannot be reconstructed as argument. My problem is that the particulars cannot be eliminated. So the argument that referred to, if it's an argument which refers to particulars, which actually is the reconstruction that Norton gives, if you compare it to, to Gensler's reconstruction, where there's no particulars involved, just general principles. So uh, yeah, and Norton's analysis of 1996, even if it's, if it's a little bit historically accurate, it's not that far away from, it's a very good reconstruction of the thought experiment, but where particulars do play a role. But it's just the assumption 8a that I would have put at the beginning. It's Galileo does it in order to eliminate other considerations. Mm -hmm. And he does it by his choice of particular considerations. If yeah. not, he would have to idolize medium away and then to bring a uh, temptation to refute the thought experiment. Could we say that you know, particulars are somewhat relative? There are some more particular particulars yeah. and some less particular particulars. Yeah. And some of the particulars are eliminated. Yeah, of course. Well, not all the facts of course. play a role. Of course. The, the so fact that it's 8 and 4 kilograms, not 12 and 6. That's right. Yeah. That, for instance. Yeah. Really but the fact, fact that both are, the, are of the same material, that you cannot eliminate. Right. Okay. So there's some Yeah, of course. That cannot of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. That seems reasonable. Yeah. But the fact that you eliminate all the particulars just deducts deduction inside a theory or inside a set of theoretical statements seems implausible. I wonder how this <coughs> argument of Galilei 
case compares to some other arguments that he gives against uh, Aristotle's physics. Um, thinking in particular of the argument of the moving ship, <coughs> which um, I always found uh, very um, interesting with respect to fire ovens analysis. Excuse me, the whole fire ovens yeah. analysis. Because fire ovens uh, argues famously <coughs> that Galileo doesn't really succeed in toppling Aristotle's theory because he presupposes his own physics. Uh, in particular, he presupposes a principle of inertia and a, um, I'm not sure I remember the argument correctly, but he thinks that uh, Galilei's argument basically um, presupposes the falsity of uh, Aristotle's yeah, physics okay. and, th and, th and therefore uh, does not really uh, succeed yeah. in top Since it presupposes inertia, yeah, yeah, presupposes yeah. the falsity, yeah, okay. Yeah. I remember correctly. Now I wonder if there's a, if there's a similar um, move that uh, an Aristotelian could make here, or a, fi a fire oven <laughs> could make here, uh, that um, this argument also does not succeed yeah. uh, in, in refuting Aristotle's account because it somehow presupposes uh, n notions or principles from from Galileo's own physics. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of in particular about the notions of weight. Both yeah, specific yeah. and absolute, where perhaps an Aristotelian has a completely different idea of some some mm. kind of a, some some yeah. dynamis, uh, which is what explains the motion in the end. And if, if two bodies do not differ in speed, they also cannot differ in weight. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah. because uh, dynamis is not the, s the Aristotelian dynamis is not the same as 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 uh, neither uh, absolute nor nor specific weight. Um, would you th would you think that such a move could work in this case? also? Uh, th that would be, I mean, complicates things a lot if you go to and look what weight, mean, weight means to Aristotle. And what the move is blocked on the level of the theories, not the, not the concept of weight, let's say. Because here he doesn't presuppose anything. So this presupposition in the, the motto, so the mediativity principle is based on some empirical uh, observation. So we tell you just directly after so the three points. The etc. here, he says, if you take an inflated bladder and uh, so two bodies of different specific weight, one falling faster than the other, it's clear that the bladder will slow. So if you take it. This is Aristotle now. No, Galileo. This is Galileo. Yeah. So this presupposition is based on semi empirical. Uh, it's the, in the discourse, it's, it will be based on a theoretical axiom, but here it's based on on semi empirical observation. Oh so if you see. take a bladder and you just put a, an inflated bladder, so a balloon, and you put a, you, you, you combine it with any ball, it will slow down the ball. So a faster moving object, which may seem out of place because the thought experiment deals with, with the object of the same species. Yeah. But since it's, it seems like he is appealing to semi empirical observation, just to justify this mediativity principle. And the other one is just Aristotle's theory. So uh, there's nothing from Galileo coming inside, uh, playing any role in the thought experiment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, maybe the concept of weight, if you analyze how Aristotle, and I did not do that, maybe it could, I don't know, but that complicates things too much, I think. You cannot make any sense if you start uh, saying that these con concepts are different to begin with. So even for the Aristotelian at the time, maybe of Galileo, they thought that the absolute weight is a causal factor. This is the purpose of the thought experiment. Yeah. Uh, not in the demoto, in the discourse. In the demoto, he didn't uh, have any. Anybody say the same speed means that at any time they have the same speed, but it's ah, clear for him that yeah, the speed okay. is changing as long as he goes on? Or yeah, but this is why he didn't. Uh, uh, no. This is 
this guy in the demoto, he didn't uh, take his hesitation further. So if you make the test, they won't fall at the same speed. But we don't look at this for the moment. It's necessary first to see why natural motion is slower at the beginning. So he wants to tackle accelerated so he doesn't have any theory about acceleration. Just then, it was on the slide number 11. Uh, I was quite surprised uh, about the argument that, uh, yeah, in the second paragraph, uh, the comparison is when the smaller was at mid tower, yeah. the larger end. And in fact, it's wrong, no? Because it's just. Not according to. This is wrong, of course, but yeah. this is why he rejects uh, total theory, because according to his theory, speed is proportional to weight. So uh, if you have a, uh, you don't have any acceleration, it's just like you have. So if you have uh, uh, two stones, one being double the other, other, Aristotle will tell you that the smaller is a mid tower and the larger is a mid tower. Yeah, what I don't understand is if, if you double the, um, the size, then you expect that speed will grow twice bigger. Yeah. But then it's the yeah, but then if you make the comparison, it's just at mid tower that you have to make the comparison. It's at, at quarter of the height of the tower that you will have the right, say, say that again. If you if you double the size, then mm -hmm. the speed of the biggest one will increase with a double pattern of the little one. Yeah, okay. So, so if you compare the speed yeah, it's okay. so then if you want to compare the distance it's when the biggest one has a bottom that the, um, the smallest one is uh, a quarter of the height of the tower and not okay. at the middle. Yeah, okay. So it's and worse, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's worse, but then <laughs> it's okay. Then my question is, does it show that for Galileo it was not clear that speed is going proportionally this time or? Yeah, maybe it could, yeah. Good question, I've never thought okay. about this, yeah. like after initially or after the small amount of time or things like that indicate that he knows that they first have to accelerate. But given that we're talking mostly here of falling bodies in media, yeah. they, in, for, for all practical purposes, reach uh, the limiting speed quite quickly, really. Okay. Uh, okay. If they're not too rare or too void or something. Th and that's... Uh, so... I, if you would be um, generous, you would grant that, okay, let, let, we're just talking about limiting speeds here, which are different. Yeah, I mean, my worry is that to take mid tower, it's, it's really a mistake that you can do if you have in mind that the speed is, that uh, the position is proportional to time and that's not proportional yeah, okay. to the square of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, so that was that, my worry. That's true, but yeah. the, this second paragraph is not saying us anything about Galileo's theory. This is just ridiculizing yeah. Aristotle's yeah. theory. I can read to you from the Kawa. This is what Aristotle says. A given weight moves a given distance in a given time. A weight which is as great and more moves the same distance in a less time, the times being in inverse proportion to the weights. For instance, if one weight is twice another, it will take half as long over a given movement. Movement. It's, it's not right. concerned with acceleration yeah, this is all. Yeah. It's just giving you... Um, you, can, you can read Atkinson, uh, 2004, Atkinson and Stephen, mm -hmm. where they analyze acceleration and terminal velocity in terms of all, all the criteria. This is nice because I show you the, the difficulty of uh, isolating all causal factors. Mm -hmm. And they say that y Galilei couldn't have known, but the gravitational field also should play a role. And it should be, it's, uh, they are just ignore, they are just refuting Brown's uh, analysis and saying that this is, uh, this is uh, how body falls, it's a matter of empirical investigation and further theory. But as a, as a destructive thought experiment, it's unparalleled for me. Right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.